Hi, everyone, and welcome to our the YWCA's third um, community discussion regarding um, racial and social justice. Um, we are really excited about our speaker today. Again, I'm Jessica Gershenfeld. I'm one of the case managers here at the YWCA. Um, we have some good stuff to talk about today, and please remember um, to respect each other when asking our questions and, um, you know, just be, keep an open mind f throughout the discussion. Um, there is a Q&A section where you can ask your questions as well as um, a chat. So we're going to kind of start with Marlene and G um, having their kind of conversation and G has some questions for Marlene and then we'll take some questions from attendees. So um, we appreciate you all joining and being a part of this, again, really important conversation. Um, and I will pass it over to Guillaume Stewart. Thank you, Jess. Uh, I'm super excited to be talking to Marlene today. I just want to say that um, right off the top. I'm also excited for so many people that signed up to be a part of the social justice series that uh, we've been conducting over the last few weeks. So I want to shout out all our listeners, the people online, on our social media platforms that uh, gave us positive feedback, said that they learned a lot, was encouraged by everything that we've been doing. Uh, we value that feedback. We value the work um, that we're allowed to do through the YWCA Bucks. Um, again, I'm excited to have Marlene Prey uh, as a part of this interview. Um, and I thought I would start because we have so many questions to get to. Um, I thought I would just start, Marlene, with you telling us a little bit about your work uh, with the Rainbow Room and with uh, Rise Up Doylestown. Uh, sure. And Jessica, did you want to welcome everyone again, or are we good to go? No, I'm not sure. It's only showing 34 attendees, and I know that we had a lot more registered, but I think, um, you know, as people continue to log on, um, you know, they can, they can kind of join as they're coming. It, it keeps going up every, like, second. It's at 37 now, so I think yeah. it'll, it'll continue to go up, okay? All right, sounds good. <laughs> All right, someone from Charlotte, North Carolina. That's so cool. I saw that. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, right on, and I see some of my favorite human beings on that list. So thank you so much, uh, Jessica and G, for having me here. It's just amazing to be here. I feel so grateful for the YWCA for your totally crystal clear and unapologetic mission statement of empowering women and eliminating racism. It actually was like a wave of relief to me when that change and and that focus of vision came through from the national organization many years ago and uh, so i'm just thrilled to 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 be here and be part of it and humbled as well so um so my work so a couple of the roles that i play in um in this community i uh, 19 years ago, started the Rainbow Room, which uh, as part of my, my work with Planned Parenthood and part of my work as a member of the LGBTQ community and as a sexuality educator. So I was out in schools all over Bucks County uh, doing sexuality education, talking to parents, talking to health classes, uh, in treatment centers, at the youth detention center. and. I believe that two of the most important and difficult conversations for parents, particularly white parents, to have with children are around race and sex. Um, and I, those are the conversations and topics that I am most drawn to navigating and facilitating in various ways. Um, so when I'm was out in the schools talking about sexuality, doing programs on puberty and health and HIV prevention, I kept getting questions from young people that we did not have satisfactory answers to. And that is the case with both issues about racism, which often come up in sensitive topic discussions, uh, so-called sensitive topic discussions, um, and certainly topics that, that we would bring up and the places that we would find ourselves as sex educators um, around Bucks County. And the other place we did not have satisfactory answers was around people asking questions related to sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. And by not satisfactory, I mean 
kids asking like, where can I go to meet other kids like me? Or I might be trans and I've never met another trans person. Or I want to take, you know, I'm a girl. I want to take my girlfriend to the prom, but my school said I'm not allowed to. Uh, and those, you know, so we basically started the Rainbow Room as a response and as uh, a dedicated response to the strengths and the passion and the knowledge and the just fierceness of the LGBTQ youth community across Bucks County. And that was 19 years ago. And we've been meeting every week for 19 years uh, in Doylestown. And, um, and it's not just like a, a haven away from like a cruel world. It's a place of celebration and education and intersectionality where we bring together other dynamics of uh, both oppression and liberation. So, so that has been a foundation. Um, and there's both personal reasons um, around my own identity and growing up with a sister who is a, who is a lesbian, who um, was both you know, proud and also had a lot of struggles in our family and in our community and in the world. Um, so, but it was also really very much in line with Planned Parenthood's mission of, you know, of providing medically accurate, age appropriate, you know, right. advocacy and sexuality education. So that's one part of what you asked is about the Rainbow mm -hmm. Room and the other about Rise of Doylestown. Um, this is, I think about the work with this, you know, this is a, not a nonprofit. This is a collective of right now about 2,500 people from mostly from the Doylestown area, but certainly from all across Bucks County and beyond that are committed to five common principles. The foundation is of beloved community. And that's according to Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, and not according to the whitewashed version of him, but according to the roots of ending poverty, militarism, and violence, um, and ending white terror. So, uh, and doing that and calling that beloved, you know, he had a name for it based on his own principles and his faith about beloved community. So that's a core foundation. And then the other four things that we organize around are uh, racial justice, environmental justice, social justice, and reproductive justice. And so it's really, uh, sometimes, you know, we've had steering committees and action committees. We helped launch the Immigrant Rights Action Group uh, in Doylestown. Um, and one of the board members is, is one of the participants here on the call, which I'm so glad about, because this is a profoundly important, amazing organization that also, make sure you all come back for, <laughs> for um, Jenny being interviewed in a couple of weeks. Um, about that work, um, because what happened is that during the last presidential campaign, a lot of the volume around, a lot of the racist and openly bigoted commentary, the volume of that got turned way up. Yep. Um, and, and that was not just a partisan thing. Like some of that has been in our in our nation and certainly within white people, um, within myself included, for generations. But the sun kind of got, like it, some of it, it, I was gonna say the sun shone on it, but that's way too beautiful of a metaphor. Like the, the rocks got moved aside and there's been an mm -hmm. exposure of some of what has been actually operating the systems and also the hearts of people and the beliefs of people in this country for a long time. So Rise Up Doylestown literally rose up in response to that. So it, this was, we, that group, unlike the Rainbow Room, has only been around for three and a half years. Um, but we've had dozens of demonstrations and organizing initiatives to work on those kind of founding principles. So there's, there were seven of us that started it um, with the participation of, you know, 2,000 people showing up on the streets of Doylestown for the largest protest in the town's history. Um, on the day after the, pres the last presidential inauguration. And, um, and also some of the people on this call were speakers at you know, future, at, at other demonstrations we've had. So that group just still exists. Right now, we are mostly amplifying the voices of black and brown uh, communities and, and organizations and 
uh, and members. Um, and right now we're actually involved in a small fundraiser for the NAACP, um, an ongoing mm -hmm. one for our local chapter. So, you know, that's, that's a little bit about what that group is right now. So. Yeah, I think, I think the work you do, as you just described, is really impactful. Um, I remember uh, when, when I first became a part of the YWCA, a lot of my colleagues here, including my board members, had mentioned you, had talked about the work that you do, um, and said that you know you add a lot of value um, to our community, to our to our Bucks County community. And so, I really appreciate uh, your, your your legacy of service that you've been building, as you point out, for a lot of years. Um, when we talked uh, for preparation for this interview, you shared something really. Uh, sensitive and very, I think, um, powerful as it connects to your social justice advocacy work. You mentioned that uh, a year and a half ago, uh, the tragic loss of your sister. Um, and again, offer, you know, my condolences for your loss, but can you talk a little bit about uh, how that impacted you and how that made you confront the ideas of violence and making it real for you in your own life with your own loved one, with your own family. Sure, thanks G. Um, yeah, so um, a little more than a year and a half ago, my sister Leslie was murdered um, and she was, and, and so immediately I became powerfully connected to a, my own process of grief and of trauma and you know the horror of that pain and the fear also that it instilled in me to have such a targeted violent hateful act um this is this you know i have one sister so this is the same sister that in, partly inspired me to start the rainbow room um she has always been a quiet warrior for justice and for science. She's, her, her career path was as a writer and a science writer. She actually wrote a lot about global pandemics um, many years ago uh, for the National Institute of Health. So I will share that one of, I mean, there's so, I'm trying to also lay, like connect it to, to the topic of racial justice. I will say that, you know, when I first found out that she was murdered. One of my first thoughts was, I really hope it wasn't a person of color because I just know how much injustice and how differently the justice system treats people of color, even when they commit horrific crimes. It turns out it was a, you know, a white grandmother that did this um, with no connection to my family, but um, certainly a, a, and she targeted my sister because she was on a bicycle. So this woman tried to kill 10 different cyclists on that day and killed Leslie. And she's in prison on nine counts of attempted murder and one count of murder. She didn't, my sister was not attacked because she was a lesbian or because she was a woman or because she was white. She was attacked because she was on a bicycle. So while there is tiniest for a moment shred of empathy or relatability that I could have to watching a loved one be slaughtered in the street and executed in, in the street, it in no way compares to, like my sister didn't walk around wondering if today would be the day that she would be killed in the street, which is what many black and brown people feel and how people are, black and brown folks are hunted um, and how white terrorism impacts their you know rates of heart disease and their their life expectancy most you know notably in their education systems and or our education systems and how they impact people differently but it really as a anti-violence educator and someone that you know i kind of have these two things that i sort of fight against and this is super oversimplified, but if I think about like hate and violence and that those were the things that struck my sister, yeah. it very much felt like it was a strike to my core and that these things that I fight against just got right to me. One of my uh, dear friends who worked for the DA's office in, um, in the town where this happened, which is in California where I grew up, 
um, is a Muslim woman of color. We went to school together. Um, she's amazing. She's been a source of support for me and my my sister-in-law, who's a you know a widow now. Uh, through all of this, we had some conversations right after that about some time that she had spent um, in uh, Rwanda. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Rwanda around um, around the rape and murder. Um, and assault of people. And we talked about, like, this was a opening for me of realizing that there's a lot more in the shadows. There's a lot more that needs to be uncovered about the violence and hatred within humanity than what I had previously faced. So um, I don't know if that's exactly where, where you were wondering. Well, anyway, yeah. that's just, it's, there's a, um, you know, there's a heaviness to the world that I did not experience before. And that is, you know, a tiny shred of the daily reality that many people of color are aware of, yet I can't speak for that because there's so much resilience and, and faith and love. I mean, I've, you know, I've heard so many people say it's a good thing, you know, that black folks just want equality and not revenge mm. um, because, and I feel the same way about, you know, why well, I want justice and safety, but I don't want revenge to this person who murdered my sister. So yeah, um, I'll leave it at that. No, I, I appreciate you sharing that with, with our, our listeners. Um, I found that very compelling because you took this tragedy, this, this horrible loss, and turned it into service and found a way to give voice to it in, in a very profound way. So I, I'm really grateful for uh, you sharing that with us, Marlene. I think that's really uh, powerful. Um, I think we got so many people interested in this topic because they wanted to know, how do I become an ally? What is being an ally mean? Um, and I think we're gonna explore that question a lot and people are gonna walk away with the answers that they need. But the first question I wanted to ask you, Marlene, is, are you a racist? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I am a racist. I participate and function and benefit from a system of racism and of, you know, whether we call it white supremacy, although we are in no way supreme. So white terrorism is sometimes a more appropriate term for the system that we, that we live in. Um, and I really think it's important and one of the actually really important parts for white people of lessening the harm that we do to people of color is that we can distinguish between what it means to be a bigot and what it means to be racist or a racist. So um, I am not a bigot. So that's one small way of reducing harm is not being like an openly hateful person towards certain people because of their identity uh, and specifically people that have less power than me. However, racism is not, it's, I mean, I think this is just so important because a lot of what white folks think, a lot of what we think is that if we're just not being assholes that we are like not contributing to the problem. And that could not be farther from the truth. Um, and like that's, I mean, it, yeah. And we shouldn't even like, no one gets a congratulations or deserves one for, for not being a bigot. But, mm. and, and I don't even, I mean, I feel a little squeamish and uncomfortable even being praised for also doing anything to lessen harm for black and brown people because it's not a praiseworthy venture to be trying to stop in some ways the harm that my people, even though I'm a first generation citizen um, and I'm a dual citizen, also of Canada, but even, uh, which is also not free from white terror and white supremacy for sure and racism, but that my ancestors, that people who look like me, that other white folks, um, that, um, like I am not free from the legacy of what folks, these folks have done. So I know one of the things we talked about, Guy, is that 
this uh, G, sorry, that this piece of um, of our humanity that gets so there white folks traded our humanity in order to gain white white uh terror and white supremacy and white superiority that's part of the history of the founding of the united states and um so whether it you know i can look at you know sort of my my family more broadly of other people from the lands that my ancestors came from of ireland and scotland and holland uh and the netherlands and that when they came to this country, they traded their Irish, a lot of their, you know, in my case, my family's Irish, Scottish, Dutch culture in order to assume the role of a white person. So that, you know, unless they still maintained an accent and maybe a few practices that they held on to, most white people have been willing to trade those or the majority of them um, in order to gain this power over other people. And of course, also to, annihilate the first the indigenous people whose land this is and steal African people uh, in order to enslave them. So I, now of course I can't even remember the question you asked something about. <laughs> oh, am I racist? So yeah. So yes. that process is part of why I am a racist because my I have inherited this white privilege that is totally unearned. That is, it's also dehumanizing. That was the piece I was adding. But it's for me, as well as oppressive and damaging and violent and lethal to people of color. Um, but I still, I can function any moment in that. I can, you know, I, I can, I, I can tr do what I can to minimize harm all the time. I am never free of harm as a white person. I am never a completely safe white person. Um, one incredible, you know, leader that talks a lot about that is who's a does you know workshops and writes books on it is Catrice Jackson talks yes. about how there's no such thing as a good white person, but that we can constantly be working to minimize the harm that we do. Uh, so yeah, racism is white. You know, is this is this race race prejudice? These automatic, you know implicit biases that go through our brains that were the way we're raised to think about people and whether we realize them or not that's part of the implicit part plus the economic power that we've inherited in terms of every institution and system being largely controlled by white people largely set up during the building so-called building of the united states these systems were set up primarily to benefit white people and most of those systems have not been radically altered um, whether it's our voting system, our law enforcement, our churches, our education system, which I work in, the nonprofit sector where I work, you know, so I'm like definitely calling in my own, my own fields mm -hmm. here as well. So, um, so yeah, it's, and how is, a, how is a racist white person, can I minimize the harm? Can I create, you know, how can I minimize the harm to people of color? And that's part of what that, question of being an ally. I know you were asking about this piece about um, am I a racist? I'll just add one other thing because I know we talked about this piece of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think it's really true and important. And I this is not something I came up with. This comes directly from my training and organizing with an organization called the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. And I definitely recommend folks look them up. Um, they also offer a very powerful two and a half day undoing racism training. Um, we brought them here to Doylestown um, 20 years ago uh, for a training and they've, uh, I've worked with them a lot over the years. And they taught me that part of what happened, you know, this piece I was saying before, part of what happened when white people became white in the 1600s for the first time that that term was ever used for human beings is that we traded these parts of our culture. We traded these parts, which is trading parts of our humanity. And also when you own other people, when you enslave them and consider them less than human, there's no way to do that without parts of our own humanity being, uh, being altered, being severed. So as I minimize harm for people of color and work to disrupt white terror and white supremacy, and certainly the focus of that is on 
the liberation for people of color, but it also brings back part of my own humanity. And I can mm. feel it. like I can feel it in my body when yes. I mean, you know, I can feel it when these things happen. And um, whether it's at a demonstration or in a boardroom or you know, watching a news story or, you know, and, and just knowing, okay, we're like, we're chipping away. And some, yeah. you know, some harm was reduced for people of color and some humanity was returned to me, but you can't, we can't be fully, I don't believe that. And again, this is not my own, this is stuff I learned from, you know, from, from leaders, anti-racist um, leaders that, that, that work is required to regain our humanity so yeah i think that's a um powerful perspective and thank you for sharing that um not just looking at injustice or racism as um bad actors or uh mm. bad experiences that people of color black and brown people encounter but also looking at it as um a loss of humanity mm. and those that practice it and I think all of us that are concerned about social justice, we work to make society uh, more human and more compassionate. And, uh, and that includes uh, all people. And, and that's what we aim for. Um, Marlene, what does it mean to be an ally? Uh, so, I, you know, the word ally is a tricky word. And it's not a word that I actually feel super comfortable with. Um, and that's okay. So there is, there's a spectrum that is sometimes talked about, um, in racial justice work and in DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion work, and sometimes mm -hmm. in, you know, cultural sensitivity trainings, um, all of which are just filled with potential problems, um, and solutions and, harm reduction. Um, but there's, there's some questioning of what, of, of the concept of an ally. Um, and that some folks within the racial justice field feel like, I don't actually, like folks of color have said over and over, I'm not interested in white allies. I want accomplices. An ally is someone that like potentially uh, could be a perform, can sort of perform allyship. Like their social media posts or the occasional, you know, uh, and I'll speak for myself, like um, a couple of years ago, I put up a Black History Month um, display with the, you know, help of a few other folks from Rise Up Doylestown um, at two schools in Doylestown. And some of the other members put them up at other schools in the Central Bucks School District. If that's all I ever do, and I'm not also you know, and for one thing, it would be performative if I like put my name on it or posted a picture of me in front of it on social media. Um, and it would be a better stand, I believe, to post a picture of it on social media that's not connected to anyone's name. So for example, doing it through Rise of Doylestown, look what's, look what's posted at Lenape Middle School. You know, please everyone take a look at it. Here's some resources to do more. So there's these ways that we perform allyship that can be, can feel like they can feel good to the so-called ally. So in this case, they can feel good to a white person. If it's around issues of sexism, they can feel good to a man to say like, I showed up for that. I put the pin on, I interrupted mm -hmm. the sexist joke or, you know, to a ally of LGBTQ plus people, it can be literally wearing a pin that says ally with a rainbow or, you know, showing up for a few things and saying, I love you, I'm always here for you, you know, um, and those, and I'm not trying to diminish how much those, those actions mean, but they are not necessarily addressing, they're not necessarily reducing systemic and the daily harm that, that oppressed or marginalized people are experiencing. So an accomplice, you know, has this like connotation of being a little bit of a troublemaker. And <laughs> you know, certainly think of, um, of the good trouble as, you know, as representative John Lewis would say that, that we need to be causing some good trouble. Um, so, so it's also putting ourselves like, uh, so it was this again is from the People's Institute. They had this, you know, it's just this one quick moment in all the workshops and trainings I've been to and meetings with them 
where they talked about like if white people feel like, and I don't mean to have like a rape, like if white people feel like their power is here and people of color is here. And when a lot of white people think about creating equity and justice, it feels every time like we're going for this, which is equity, it feels like that. It feels mm. like every loss is like, oh, I just lost everything. Or if affirmative action is instituted at my school or my workplace, I'm gonna actually be in worse shape. And just footnote, the main benefactors of affirmative action have always been white women. So um, even the intention behind that in the 70s didn't result in, uh, in the, the outcomes that were hoped for by black and brown folks. So being an ally, being an accomplice, and I'll just say whatever the term is, you know, being, um, and you know, like this is, I have a visual aid here. This is a book by Catrice Jackson, Jackson called Antagonists, Advocates and Allies. Um, the wake up call guide for white women who want to become allies with black women. Um, and so, you know, there's just, first of all, great book, white folks, white women, definitely check it out. But even, you know, even so that whether you're an activist, an advocate, an ally, an accomplice, um, a co-conspirator, the, what it means to, I think what you're getting at is not what I just did, which was like a mini lecture on terminology and jargon, but what does it mean to actually stand up and show up for people of color as a white person around issues of racism? And also it's not just around racism, it's also around anti-blackness because certainly other people of color um, also perpetuate anti-blackness. And that's not the same thing as racism, but um, it's one, you know, it's, an, it's a very specific and important to identify phenomenon. So it, there's so many different things that, I mean, I will just say that some of the most important things, which is like the opposite of what I'm doing right now, is shutting up and listening to black people. And I know you, we already laughed and talked about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're on, so I want you to talk. But, right. um, and you know, there was a beautiful example of it on Saturday in Morrisville. I was invited and so like, just profoundly inspired by a group of, of residents in Morrisville led by two black women who had a Black Lives Matter protest there um, on Saturday and there were like 300 people there. It was incredible. It's the first thing like this that's ever happened in the Morrisville community. And, um, and at one point in some of the organizing, we had Zoom calls like every other night for a couple weeks, I think. And there's a white guy, um, an amazing co-conspirator or accomplice who's on the, oh. on the leadership team. And at, at, you know, at one point we were talking about like, who's gonna speak and when are we gonna speak and who's gonna say this? And you know, he really clearly stated, I'm not gonna, I, you know, I'd feel better if someone introduced me uh, that I was invited to speak rather than just like our next speaker is because it's really important that we're intentional about how we pass the mic and how we mm -hmm. take the mic um, and how like white people literally made the mic like figuratively, you know, like metaphorically. Um, and, you know, and it, so that, that to me was a really beautiful example, uh, or not just a beautiful, I mean, you shouldn't need praise to just do the right thing and to minimize harm. So he was doing the right thing by saying, I'm not going to take the mic unless I'm invited to. And, you know, and, and that was a constant navigating of even putting on that, you know, pulling together that protest is really making sure as white folks that were in, that were invited into it and all of them were community members except for me, that we are taking our cues and checking in about them from the folks of color. And I'll say another really important thing is even, I know that places like the NAACP have had a lot of new um, contacts since the right. recent uprisings. And that can really be a tremendous burden also on a small, fierce, you know, nonprofit that suddenly like, oh, what can I do? I want to get involved. How can I help? And to really actually also just be patient, first of all, send money. So that's a great way to take action. Even if it's $5, they have a PayPal account. 
Um, I just became a lifetime member last week. So that's like that's awesome. that a very significant way that doesn't deserve any applause, but it's just the right thing to do. It helps to minimize harm. It's actually the right thing to do based on what my ancestors and I have done for most of my life as a white person, most of it unconsciously, some of it I'm consciously for sure. Um, but also to like, and, and I know that this is, you know, I mean, I've been, and there's a few folks that are listening in here where I've been feeling them in my heart so much, people of color during this time and been uncertain about how to reach out because I don't think that a bunch of black people want to get all these like sympathetic text messages from white folks who are suddenly feeling bad or mm -hmm. maybe like me who have felt a little more bad than some other white people for a long time, but I'm now inspired to send a message out of the blue. And so being aware that there's also been this public pain that we have been able to see in a new way um, as white folks and that, um, so passing the mic, listening, if you're gonna do a book club, pick a book by a woman or a person of color rather than like the, you know, the, the white women that we often go to. And since I have another visual aid, this is a great book if you're gonna do a book club by a woman of color, a black woman, um, Layla Saad, Me and White Supremacy, um, and another you know, favorite book of mine, Killing Rage, and this was like on a college reading list 30 years ago um, for me. And so listening to following, you know, if you have, if you're on social media, do everything you can to follow black and brown leaders in the racial justice um, world around to listen to their voices um, to to listen to not comment unless you're invited to we are so accustomed to centering ourselves to having the mic to taking the stage to making it about us to having our feelings all over the place um, our white tears our white fragility which is not actually fragility at all it is actually really violent um, when I think about, you know, the white woman in Central Park who, you know, altered her voice to sound more scared while she was, calm. I mean, that was a, that was not fragility, actually. That was a weapon of her, her whiteness. And um, again, not my terms, that one, you know, that is a, that is not some term I came up with, but um, so, yeah, and, you know, another idea that, that came up with a, a, a member of the NAACP uh, maybe a year ago when we were talking on the phone, we were talking about um, how we can do more work in the schools, how, how we can do more work to have an anti-racist curriculum or policies or practices in place in our public schools. And she mentioned, and she's a black woman, that she often during back to school night either does or wants to raise her hand and ask for details on how black history is taught throughout the school year. And I thought, and I said this to her, I was like, you know what would be also awesome is if we could write some of those questions down, pass them out to a whole bunch of white parents and have every single one of them ask that same question in every single classroom mm. they can do on back to school night. So that it is, that we are literally amplifying the voices of black people in our community and that we are holding our school districts accountable. And, you know, there's a messed up reality that sometimes people in power listen more to white people and using that in a responsible way. Um, mm. Or if we can't pass the mic and say, actually, I'm not gonna ask my question because I noticed three other people have their hands up and they're you know, all people of color. But if, if we're the only ones in the room to, or you know, what, regardless, whatever the situation is, if, to ask those questions. And knowing also that that's not, again, that is not just an answer that, and a, uh, an issue that's brought up that will be important for for black and brown students in that school. That will be the answer to that question has a tremendous impact on white students, on my son, you know, like mm -hmm. I, he needs to have that education. And the fact that I didn't meant that there was like a major shattering of my perception of mm -hmm. my whiteness and of our country when mm -hmm. I finally started digging in and realizing stuff. Um, you know, in my 20s. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm going to ask you, Marlene? I think we've seen uh, so many uh, young people being a part of the social movement now. So many uh, people from different backgrounds getting out, becoming active, 
wanting to know how can I be an ally? How can I help? And I think, I think those are really important questions. And you gave us some, some real life examples that we could, we could uh, emulate and follow. You shared with me the other day an interesting uh, story about your son who was sort of asking the same questions. You know, how can I be an ally? And uh, can you share that with the listeners? I thought that was really compelling, especially from a young, a young student, you know, wanting to be active, wanting to help. That was really powerful. Yeah, sure. And someone just asked for the book title. So I'm going to just so Killing okay. Rage, Ending Racism yep. by Bell Hooks. So there's one. Um, Me and White Supremacy by Layla Saad. And if you have the ability to do so, please order them from your independent bookstore. Um, they need our support and love right now. And then, um, and then this book by Catrice Jackson. So, okay. And I can throw those in again, or if there's follow-up. So yeah, so I've got a, you know, sixth grader um, who, uh, I, we were having a conversation about the N-word and about, do you hear it? What's, and I was using a teachable moment because my um, awesome FedEx guy was called the N-word by, uh, by a neighbor. And there, a whole group of us responded. Uh, to take action around that. Um, and so I use that to say, hey, this just happened. Here's what we're doing as a response. What are your thoughts on that? You know, like we reached out to the supervisor at FedEx to let them know, like, hey, can you offer, you know, just want to check in on what support you offer for your employees when they face this kind of, you know, horrible treatment because this just happened to this guy that all of us know, he's been our FedEx driver for a long time and covers half of Doylestown Borough. And then we put out the hate has no home here signs all along that street and there had been none and now there's you know a bunch of them there. It's not enough. It doesn't actually make him necessarily make him safer or make him less likely to be harmed. Some of that was a little bit about making us feel better about this gross thing that one of our neighbors had just done. So, um, I just want to like own that as far as what we sometimes think we're doing as being allies when it might not actually do anything to to reduce harm. So I was sharing some of this and some of my concerns and my wonderings about it with my kiddo and said, so what would you do if you heard someone use the N-word? And, um, and some of what he, and this is part of coming back to like these difficult conversations for parents. Um, and it's obviously very different conversations that we have with our parents based on what the color of their skin is. Um, but the two, two of the hardest topics for folks often to talk about and are race and sex. And they're two of the most important and, um, and our lives depend on them. Um, and differently based on, on on our so-called racial group. But so one of his first thoughts was, well, if it's, if they can see my face, I would make a face, like a face that looked like I was disgusted. And I was like, oh, okay, show me that face. And he's like, you know, maybe, <laughs> I was like, okay, right. that's really right. good. Like, you know, what about if it's not on that? And he talked about playing like a video game where sometimes there's a lot of people on at once. And, um, and talked about like, do you, the discomfort that he has, and you know, there's other underlying issues that contribute to his own discomfort, um, but of calling someone out, you know, and I talked about the difference between calling someone out and calling someone in, like if it's someone you know, and you weren't able to say anything in the moment, could you come back later and tell them, hey, that thing you said, I did not like the use of that word, and I don't want you to use that again, um, he reported someone on one of the platforms, so reported that the racist language is, was used. Um, I also told him about how this happened in a group of middle schoolers recently in Central Bucks and that one of the kids reported it to Safe to Say. So the information, this is a you know anonymous tip line, the information actually got back to the school guidance counselor. Um, sadly, the school is not taking any action to even help, um, but you know, if enough of these calls continue to come in and we continue to educate our, you know, our, our school leaders um, and administrators, we can hopefully make some changes with how we respond to incidents when they happen. 
Um, and then we talked about being an upstander. Uh, and like a lot of other kids, there is a tremendous fear that my, well, I shouldn't say tremendous, but my kid has some fears that are similar to the tremendous fears that kids have, that some kids have of being an upstander, not being a bystander, but actually interrupting harmful behavior when you see it. And the concern that, well, then I'm going to be targeted. And a couple things for me come up with that. One is that if people think that we're going to dismantle racism and white terror by being safe, they're wrong. And we're going to just have however many more years of this problematic system that we have. And problematic is like such an understatement. This, you know, deadly system, dehumanizing system, broken system. Or as some people say, actually the system is not broken. It is doing exactly what it was designed to do, which is to uphold white people at the cost for people of color. Um, so I talked about, well, what do you, you know, we t and, and actually even since you and I talked, G, I've talked to him a little bit more about it because I've been mm -hmm. thinking a lot about it, of what does it mean to risk some safety in order to reduce yeah. harm, you know? And knowing that even, you know, and some of the work that many of us do as advocates against violence and, um, and dismantling racism work is, is to create you know, to try and build more people up to be upstanders, because if you have more folks doing that work, and if a school has a, creates a culture that normalizes upstander behavior, and if a family has a culture that normalizes upstander behavior, like, you're not just going to see me once correct someone for saying something racist, like, you're going to see it all the time, and I want you to join in. And we see the same thing in the other direction, uh, which is that families learn harmful behavior and racist bigoted behavior or quiet polite silent acquiescence and then often replicate what they see their their parents um or guardians do so um was there something now i'm like no. now i can't remember what i had talked to you about with myself <laughs> no i think that no i think you covered that I, I i just was excited because i feel like younger kids have a voice our youth have a voice and we want to encourage them to be advocates and to be upstanders. And um, I, I, I wanna say this, we're getting so many questions oh, good. Okay. from my online <laughs> platform. Um, and I'm gonna get to those questions, but one of them right off the top was, what are some action steps that allies should be taking? What are some action steps we could take as allies of uh, social justice and racial justice in society? Some action steps. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so, and and are you speaking, I mean, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna answer for people of color, um, cause that's problematic for me to pretend to, I mean, that's, yeah. I, yeah. but I will say certainly amplifying, listening to the voices of folks of color that are leaders in that, that, that are invested and have been doing the work around racial yeah. justice. And that's not for me to, to judge. Um, and showing up, um, whether it's showing up to certainly to protest, but also, I mean, that is not the most, that is not the only thing we should be doing at all. Um, and in fact, that can be performative if all we're doing is showing up um, at, at dem public demonstrations, but showing up at school board meetings, showing up at, um, at council meetings of our municipalities, of our borough councils and townships, um, and cities showing up, paying attention, expressing our voice, writing, you know, making statements. And like the example of, you know, I, who knows what back to school night, if there will be one, will even look like. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> but using those moments right. to to amplify, to find out what are some of the core needs that people of, that 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 reduce harm to people of color, and that also in tandem with that, bring back some of the humanity for white folks mm -hmm. and, you know, together yeah. and taking those, taking those steps. Um, and I would certainly invite people to support, find local community organizing efforts and get involved. So that is a core one. So whether you are, and like thinking about Bucks County, 
you know, even long after I'm gone, the NAACP is still going to be going strong. They have a history of over a hundred years of doing this yep. work and of legal support. And I see or saw that Fred um, Haran is on the call and he'll be next week's, I think next that's week. Right. That's Matt is next week. But anyway, you know, like I know that the NAACP and the reason I bring them up is working with the Ben Salem Police Department right now. Yeah. And they're going to be working with other law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for example, um, a couple weeks ago, there was some really super vile, offensive graffiti spray painted just outside of Doylestown uh, on, um, on a wall of our state rep, who is a big supporter of Black Lives Matter, Wendy Ullman. And it was very clearly done by, I mean, to me anyway, to those of us that do this work, it was very clearly done by someone that was an opponent of Black Lives Matter, but they were trying to put it up there to sort of make us look bad because, and we've seen this, including in Lower Bucks, these posters that have been put around that have this really grotesque um, depiction of what Black Lives Matter means. And it's like yeah. about killing white people and just absolute complete, complete nonsense um, and violence. I mean, this really is, you know, it's not to be minimized. This is, but it's strategically done by opponents of Black Lives Matter in order to try and say, look, we told you they were bad. And so anyway, when we, when this was found out that this happened in Plumstead Township, um, the chief of police immediately said this was an anti-cop action. And those of us in the Black Lives Matter community in this area were like, absolutely not. This was actually done most likely by an opponent of of the movement for Black Lives, trying to do exactly what it has happened is make you think, you know, we're out to get you or whatever. So we immediately uh, organized a meeting with the chief. So less than 48 hours after that spray paint was found, we were sitting in the chief's office, nine of us from Plumstead Township. I was the only one not from the township, um, including a family, you know, a Black family that was the primary, they were the primary leaders of this and asked for help and asked me for help. So we worked together to bring people together. 50 people from Plumstead signed this letter where we could present it to him and say, we are not gonna let our narrative be hijacked by hateful people. This is not who we are. We would not be spray painting this. And even if somehow it's discovered that it was someone that supposedly is supportive of Black Lives Matter. It certainly is not the representation of the movement of the. Right. So that was, you know, so, and and the only reason that people found out about that, if they did, was because they saw it on Facebook, because that's where we did the organizing, was in the Rise Up Dolestown Facebook group. And folks mm -hmm. are welcome to join if you're in the area or just want to see what we're doing. But joining the NAACP, following what the YWCA does, I mean, there you go. I love Jessica that you just popped your. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> right at the top of the screen. Uh, the Immigrant Rights Action Group is another very important organization to support. And again, come back for them on this um, on the same thing in a few in a in a month or so. Um, so getting involved in local community organizing efforts and talking to your kids about stuff and showing up asking what is the school district doing to address, you know, to, to implement an anti-racism plan in the district? And there's a lot of examples of what that even means that are out there. Google, like do the internet research, don't rely on your, you know, your beloved friends of color or the black person that you meet that seems so open and ready to talk, like do the research so that we're not putting that emotional labor unless we're paying people of color for it. But, um, and there's certainly like workshops and stuff that folks can participate in that will, you know, the Peace Center is another amazing resource in the community. Yes. Um, and you all are, you know, constantly have your finger on this pulse. Um, training for Change is a, an anti-racism training institute in Philadelphia, which is, you know, just right mm -hmm. next door to us that does incredible work. Um, they have a three-day workshop called Whites Confronting Racism that sold out in like two days. And it was written by people of color. They are the accountability group. They asked a group of white trainers to, to lead it. And all the, fun, the funds and the benefits from that come back to the people of color. So this is a partnership. It's not a bunch of white people that just decided I'm gonna reach my people. It was really done with 
intense, with intentional accountability to the black and brown folks that are part of that organization. That's done also through Training for Change and they're doing it online um, and have a waiting list for their next view. So those are a couple. I, okay, what else you got? I'm, I think that's great. Jessa, Jess is on, so that means we have a lot of questions. She has a couple questions for you. Jess, well, you want to read some of the questions? Yeah, so gee, we actually, and, and I know Marlene, we spoke right before this. I think you can see them, the questions too. Um, we just have one question so far, a couple other um, just kind of good input as far as um, what Marlene has been talking about the whole time. Um, but I think this question will give us some, some good things to talk about. So um, we have the question, can you share some strategies on how to talk to white friends and family who get defensive when discussing race? How do we break through the white fragility? That is a that is a very popular and important question. Yeah. And also someone just wrote in vote. Yes. So <laughs> momentary side note is not only vote, but organize to lift the voting restrictions that happen all over the country because they are primarily targeting black people and black and brown people and people that are incarcerated. And so definitely engaging in our electoral process and at every level, school board members you know, county commissioners, senators, all, you know, all the constables, you know, all the, all the way, all, all the way up and down and inside and out. So strategies for talking to white folks who, um, well, I will say it is so important that if, that, that white, that we don't give up on our family members. We don't give up on, you know, that racist uncle and just think, I'm just gonna block you and never talk to you again. Because then we put that burden back on people of color to, and, 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 or maybe on no one, that, that those you know, um, stereotypes that that person may have just are continued. Um, so like this is super simplistic, but one of the strategies like, and this comes out of my training in domestic violence awareness and prevention, is that if you hear a stereotype, sometimes it helps to say, and, and I don't mean this in like a condescending way, but find a piece of that that you can relate to that maybe you used to think like, you know what, I used to think that. I used to think this thing actually. I mean, I have plenty of them, so I don't have to make them up, you know, crap, racist things that I was taught to believe. And then I learned, what did I learn? And now I know. So I used to think, and then I learned, and now I know. So that, I, like that. I mean, that's, I, and that's like so oversimplified that I'm almost embarrassed to say it, but I also know we're getting short on time. Um, and, and really not giving up. And I will also say, and that, you know, there's another really incredible process and I'm going to forget the name of it, Courageous Conversations. Um, and there's mm -hmm. some folks out of Indivisible Lambertville New Hope are doing some of that work. Um, and they are actually really working on having conversations, not where you just spew facts at someone and say, let me break down. Like, I always dream that I could just have this encyclopedia of facts. So when someone said, that's not what slavery was, I can be like, boom, boom, yeah. boom. <laughs> but that doesn't, actually, that doesn't actually get to the values that that person has. Their values mm -hmm. about their own internal, I mean, there's this thing called internalized racial superiority and white fragility or white terror is part of that. Um, and then there's internalized racial inferiority that is a con you know a concept of how folks of color start to believe in these um, stereotypes and prejudices that are perpetuated. Um, so there's a lot of really good stuff out there about being able to like kind of hold space for some, you know, racist comments and how to talk to our white friends about it, but it's also exhausting. And I, you know, and, and I, you know, sometimes I just want to send like every link and a whole list of books, but then I'm like picturing this person going, Oh my gosh, I just oh, asked well. you this one. Yeah. Question, and now I have like all this homework. Well, also if you don't have time, like if you're too tired to like read the book or do the work, then, I mean, what you don't want to do is put that burden on people of color. Like that's where, you know, there are probably going to be some folks, frankly, that are just not reachable. Um, and then, you know, but I, you know, I've been amazed to work with people that have actually left the clan and are now mm. you know, 
actively involved in bringing down racist gangs like the Klan, um, including here in Bucks County. Um, so, okay. Final questions, anything else before? That's what I was just, just sending out a little remark if there are any final yeah. questions. I think what you said about, um, you know, what, what you used to think and then, you know, what you learned and what you think now is really important. And I know that you um, mentioned how oversimplified it sounds, but I think for some people who are, might just be, you know, entering this kind of work or just be, um, you know, finally turning um, to be a part of it, that is a really good way to put it. And a really, you know, yeah. like you said, a really simplified way for people to um, be able to talk about some of these things that aren't always comfortable to talk about. So I, I appreciate that little tool. Um, yeah. No, let me just echo that and say that, that I think is part of what we hope to achieve through, through our mission is reaching people who are open to learning open to making these changes um, and open to correcting behavior. Uh, so I, I'm excited. I think it was very simple to the point, but it's easy to, to grasp onto. And that's what we want. We want to invite people to, to that process of change. Yeah, did you have another question, Jeff? I don't see any more questions. There's a ton okay. of people that are very, you know, very yeah. saying very informative, um, you know, very thankful for all this. So Marlene, thank you again. Um, and Gee, do you want to kind of close us out? Yeah, I want to say that I feel um, really happy and um, uh, excited to have been a part of this conversation with Marlene. Uh, we invited her, we reached out to Marlene because of her great work in the community, because she is a great resource and um, has been doing this work and it's not easy work. Um, and it's a lot of labor, but I, but I definitely know from talking to Marlene that it's a labor of love. It's something she's, she's committed to. And so I want to say thank you to, to Marlene again. And uh, thank you to the committee who's been working on these uh, racial justice series. Thank you to all our listeners. We had so many uh, great comments from people, from nonprofits, uh, just members of the Y, uh, law enforcement, just various people saying how much they enjoy the work that we're doing. So. We're excited. So I want to save the last few minutes for the star of this broadcast, which is Marlene. Uh, and, and can you give us some closing remarks, Marlene, as we as we head to lunch, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you for and thank you, everybody. I did put my email there. So if anybody wants to follow up on something or you missed a book mm -hmm. title, you could send me an email. Um, I'd be really happy to help you connect with other resources and mm -hmm. i love that people are like yes book clubs yes voting mm -hmm. um you know yes protesting like keep showing up over and over keep right. you know for those of us that are white folks on this uh call keep listening keep reading keep you know doing your work and knowing that this is never over like we are trying to and it's not about being safe um so we gotta just let that go. We gotta let that go. This is, it's never ever been safe for people of color. So we are gonna need to join in on that, um, on that struggle. And by doing so also be regaining our humanity. I will just say that again, mm. because it's so profound. So the rewards are not about the reward I get with the good feeling I get to see a racist system brought or part of a system brought down, but knowing, you know, well, that is personal, that's the goal is, is liberation and, you know, and freedom for everyone. Um, no, I just, yeah. Can I stop you really quick? I'm so sorry. One question just came through and I think it's a really good one. And we, I don't want to go too far over, but maybe you can just touch on it. Um, someone wrote the question about the internet. So have you ever oh, had yeah. a productive conversation about race over social media or the internet? Any tips? So I know that's good probably question. a loaded question as well. well okay. you can touch on it. That's all right. Um, God, it's such a good question. Oh my gosh. And I just, like, I have so much, I, I'm just watching what happened in Morrisville, the whole growth of that Morrisville against hate group mm -hmm. started because anytime some of the folks within that group talked in their general social media pages, 
on like not theirs, but in Morrisville community pages, they got absolutely attacked mm -hmm. uh, for speaking out against racial terror and white terror and against um, the killing, you know, the, the execution of George Floyd. Um, and so they were like, oh my gosh, we literally have to create our own group so that we're just not constantly getting either like censor, oh, I'm not censor because it's not free speech, it's somebody's page, but that they're not getting constantly shut down and mimicked and belittled. So sometimes creating a group that's focused on that and protecting yourself from trolls is really important because the trolling on the internet around racism is absolutely rampant and exhausting. I, absolutely exhausting. There's a group called, or I don't even know if it's a group, it's just like a social media little movement called White nonsense roundup so that and it's specifically so that if they're if a especially if a person of color makes some kind of comment about and then it's attacked by racist language by, by bigots and racist trolls on the internet that they can tag hash you know like do a tag the white nonsense roundup and that those white anti-racist people at their keyboards will like come in and like round up the nonsense that other white people are doing so that we're not putting that burden on people of color. And I have seen some amazing action happen around that. Some that really is just about like reclaiming narratives, blocking people, but some that has been transformative in terms of like actually watching, watching people change as conversations mm -hmm. go on. Um, but it's tricky because some folks are really just there to cause problems and to instigate and to make things worse and to put, you know, memes and jokes and offensive statements on just to try and derail progress and to try and and kind of mess with the narrative of beloved community and racial justice. So um, it's and it's also hard work to hang in there with it or to not just explode sometimes at the vitriol of people online. Um, so I'll say that it's- Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I didn't want to uh, overlook that last question. Yeah. Um, so that's our last question. I want to say thank you again to Marlene for being a part of this important conversation. Thank you to all our listeners. I know that they learned a lot, got a lot of great information. All the folks that log on and support the YW, we appreciate it. All our community partners. Um, and a special shout out to the staff that's been working on this, this committee, doing really great work around uh, social and racial justice. So we hope that you guys join us for our next one. Um, we're excited. We're going to be interviewing um, our, our DA, Matt, um, the DA of Bucks County. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, I think it's going to be great. So see you next week. Definitely. Thanks, Marlene. Bye, all. Thanks. Bye.